welcome to another episode of Inside the Recording Studio. I am Jody Whitesides, and with me as always is Mr. Chris Hallstrom. How are you today, Chris? Well, right now I'm just sitting here being impressed by that uh, long intro, but <laughs> apart from that, I'm doing good. How are you doing, Jody? Uh, I'm trying to get my head back into a good space after being nearly clipped out by a skier today on a chairlift. Yeah, you told me the story. That was uh, it, it just makes you want to shake your head at people's behavior sometimes. <laughs> but, uh, I guess that's just the world that we live in at this point. Yeah, uh, I guess so. All right. Yeah. So what are, we, we're, what are we on about today other than chairlifts? Well, first, I think we should pay a little attention to this is actually our hundredth episode. So bing, yay, bing, us bing, bing, bing. yay, everybody that's been so listening. Bad. And oh, if you've gosh. listened to all hundred of them, thank you very much. Really appreciate <laughs> it. Beautiful. So what we're going to talk about today is what we're calling this abnormal uses of mics. Yes. In other words, miking techniques that go a little bit off the beaten path and very much down the road of the experimental, perhaps, more or less. But we all know to mic a source, we basically just stick a microphone in front of it, right? And there's varying things that we might do, like distance to the source and angles and things in the way of if we're talking guitar cabs, that kind of thing. But we're not going to talk about those today. We're going to talk about different ways of miking stuff. Is things that true? That are just out of the ordinary. So what's the most out of the ordinary miking technique that you have used? It involves a poster tube. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm intrigued. <laughs> Please Actually, explain. It involves a couple of poster tubes. I took a couple of poster tubes and taped them together. To create one giant long poster yes, tube? Or? to create one long tube-like thing and then set that in front of a guitar amp. And on the other end of the long-ass tube thing, I stuck an SM57 in the center of it. So As essentially, I was getting a very centered, round, little sound. But the yeah. interesting thing about doing it is it became very, very directional and very hyper-focused on whatever section of the speaker cabinet that I put it on. So that's probably the weirdest thing that I've done, although I've done other weird things. What about you? I haven't done anything as weird as that. Well, um, shit, this is going to blow the whole episode right now. <laughs> right. But, but first, be, before we go on and talk about me, I want to, what possessed you to do that? Or what were, was this coming from a place of just pure experimentation? Or did you have a sound in your head that you wanted to do? Or what, what made you do that? I think it came down to wanting to have something hyper-focused on a small area of the speaker. And obviously when you're using a mic like an SM57, if you're not cupping around the diaphragm of it, you're going to get a whole lot of the sound as it attacks the entire front end of the mic. I also wanted something that kind of gives the whole megaphone effect yeah, kind of thing, but more naturally speaking. Okay. So and doing so where you cut off a lot of the signal, so to speak, and then you're forcing it down the length of a tube also gives a really weird, I can't say room because it's not technically a room, but it gives a very, very strange reflection in the tube as it goes down the tube before it hits the mic. Yeah. But this, I'm assuming, was not going to be your main guitar no, sound. No. This was, was just a, right. It was a section of something. So. Mm -hmm. Had you seen that done before? Or was it something that you just like, oh, I wonder what this is going to do? No. Originally, I or thought I might just put the – it was a little amp. It was a Fender VibraChamp is what I have. Mm -hmm. and so it's not a very big amp. And my initial thought was to put it inside the barbecue. Obviously, not when the barbecue is on, but just to have it in some kind of weird environment that, to my. That would it. be metal. Yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> to put an amp <laughs> in a barbecue pit and then close the lid and mic it from there. So that was sort of the idea, but obviously that would get a very, very different sound than arranging it with a poster tube. I just decided rather than sticking it in the barbecue, I would use a poster tube instead. So the, the choice is there was <laughs> yeah. barbecue yeah. or poster tube, right? <laughs> and you found that the, the, the barbecue is just too weird on the phasing, yeah. right? <laughs> so, <laughs> well, that, that, yeah, that's, that's, a, 
that's an abnormal use, I guess. Not necessarily a normal use of a mic, but but it's certainly the miking technique. And I guess that's yeah. kind of what we're. Yeah. No, I think for me, I've been really conservative. I think I think that probably the the weirdest thing I've done, and I hesitate to even call it weird, would probably be something that I heard from like Eric Valentine that was to kind of try a mic behind the cabinet kind of thing of a guitar cabinet, mm-hmm. I've that done type that. of thing. But yeah, again, it's an effect. It's not like your main sound or anything, but when you're trying stuff out just to see what happens, sometimes you stumble upon things that are just appropriate. Well, well here's oh, the oh, question though, but did you have it yeah. with an open back or a closed back when you did that? This one was an open back. Okay. So it got obviously it was still throwing back, right? But mm-hmm. um, I, I can't remember if we actually ended up using it. That's as far as my experimentation has gone. Um, You're with that. so square. I know, but generally, you know, with with time constraints and stuff, it, it just it's rare, perhaps, that you have people that are super eager to experiment. But when you do, it's fun. You can come up with some kind of cool stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, now, in another episode, I know you mentioned a vocal instructor that turned you on to an interesting thing with using a PZM mic yes. as a vocal mic. So, Which is so, not a normal thing by any stretch yes, of the imagination. That, well, that, yeah. <laughs> it's a giant square block of a of a microphone that's literally it's intended to be stuck on walls to be a room mic type thing. And I'm not right. sure how great of a room mic it really is. I haven't used them too extensively for that. However, he said, in a pinch, if you really need a vocal mic that can work, you go down to your radio shack and you pick up a PZM mic. And you stick it with, you know, <laughs> his, his explanation was, and I've not used it this way. I've just stuck it on a stand. But he was saying that you could stick it on a table or on a chair back or something. I guess you would kneel up to it and you would just use vice grips to clamp it down to something, which to me kind of seems like it would screw up the way that the mic is intended to work. But he goes, then you get right up on top of it, literally singing a half inch from it or whatever, and you sing into it from there. And it becomes a relatively usable vocal mic if you're hmm. in a pinch. And they're not expensive mics if they're even still available from right. Radio Shack because I don't know the last time I actually saw a Radio Shack. Yeah, I was going to say, never mind being available from Radio Shack. Never mind. Would you ever find a, a Radio Shack even at this point? Yeah, but I guess the weirdest thing is is that you're obviously smelling your own breath as you do this because they are a big square. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you have to you're get blown right really back close. in your own face with your own voice. So, yeah. right. Well, interesting. What were those results like, though? Because I I imagine it sounding either really nasally or really boxy, or certainly not full frequency. But maybe I'm wrong. That's why you get right up on it. The closer you get to it, the more the range of the voice you're going to get. If you're too far back, it I, the low end drops off drastically. So it's definitely a proximity effect type thing that you have to get on it because it's not the most responsive mic. Because the idea of the PZM is that you're putting it on a wall and the wall is absorbing some of the vibrations that it's to pick up, which is where you get more of your full frequency. Right. So I guess you could stick it on the wall and just scream at the wall. (laughs) Do it that that way, but that would be a little less likely to be as, I guess... Intimate, I don't know. It's very intimate to get up on a mic that that close. Yeah. You being a singer as well, Mm -hmm. whereas I'm not. Yeah, um, I'm definitely not going to compare the PZM to, say, a C12. It's not going to compare. No, of course not. (laughs) Yeah, no, that that would be ludicrous. But but again, it could be a fun sort of effect, right? Now, Mm -hmm. one thing that that sticks out to me is I was talking about perhaps abnormal uses or anything – out of the ordinary is probably a better way of saying it. But I'm reminded of the guitar tone in Money for Nothing mm-hmm. by Dire Straits. Yes. Which I guess is just it has a very distinct guitar sound, right? And I guess that was just the way they mic'd it. Well, it's also it, yeah. partially because of the way Mark Knopfler tends to play guitar. Well, sure. But but I mean, but the actual tone, he doesn't sound like that in everything he does, no, you know. So obviously being a finger style player, but – there's one thing where that just works. I wear in other cases, if we hadn't heard money for nothing and you're dialing up that sound, I would probably go, 
ew, that sounds horrible. Fix that now, you know? Yeah, but now um, that you're relating this story, are you going to finish it off with how they did it? I don't know how they did it. All I know is that they actually had a certain angle on their mic. Mm. Uh, and, and it was one of those things where it's just like, yeah, that, that sounds kind of interesting. So I think, now I'm, I'm speculating here, but I think it was just during them setting up and trying to get tones. And it was just by pure chance that, oh, that sounds interesting, right. you know? You know, sometimes you succeed and sometimes you don't, right? But again, you being a singer here, have you ever done that singing vocals in a bathroom kind of thing? I've tried it. Yeah. Yeah. And? Well, let's discuss it after a word from our sponsors. And we're back. What was your question again? Have you ever recorded yourself singing in the bathroom? Now, I'm not talking about just singing in the shower like a lot of people do, but actually... No. Exactly. Yeah. Now we all imagine Jody naked. (laughs) Please don't. Uh, Yeah. (laughs) All right. Yes. I have tried doing the bathroom thing in terms of singing and it's not something that I would regularly do. Right. No, I mean, because the the sound isn't necessarily the greatest sound. It takes a long time to set up a mic in a bathroom to make it sound reasonable. Yeah. The the juice doesn't justify the squeeze is what you're saying. Right. But that was one of those things that, People would. Do it also before depends we... on the bathroom because if a bathroom is entirely tiled, that's one thing. If it's not entirely tiled and it's mostly wood, or if it's mostly towels or who knows what, it could be a very different thing. You can mic up anywhere; it really doesn't matter. However, thinking about bathrooms in another sense, there's another thing that has been tried, and that is sticking an amp on one side of the tub and then mm-hmm. setting the mic on the other side of the tub, which is sort of akin to using the whole poster tube thing. (laughs) Right. It's much brighter and you're getting a bit more width out of the sound and a lot more glass off of it because of the reflections on the tub and the fact that it's metal and, and porcelain. Right. When we're talking about that technique, when I think of it is before we had, well, before the advent of the DAW and all the amazing gear and stuff that we have at this point, Mm -hmm. it was one of those things that people used to do to emulate a reverb on the vocal, right? Because they had it, especially if it was, let's say, a tiled bathroom, right? You'd obviously get a lot of reflections. Mm -hmm. Now, Short and quick ones too. Yeah, and it just gives a little bit of space, right? Now, does that compare to anything remotely close to what we can do today? So no, of course not. But it's one of those things that experimentation might garner some, some interesting results. Right? Well, the other thing to remember, too, in recording with microphones, regardless of your source being a guitar or a vocal or some other instrument, you're going to get some semblance of that room which is going to get you some uniqueness to the world around you unless you're recording at the world famous type of recording studio or something where their room is notorious for being sounding something good. The idea of doing an abnormal use or having it set up weird in an environment that isn't normal is to get you that unique flavor, which you're never going to get with a soft synth, which you're never going to get with some kind of plugin. You can, you, modify things sure but to get your original sound to be like utterly different you need to go out on a limb and try something different and just before we started taping here you mentioned a story from a rather famous engineer glenn johns and his drum miking technique how about you describe that that's an interesting one because it is it abnormal no but it's not necessarily how most engineers would mic a kit today, I dare say, right? And it comes down to having essentially three mics, sometimes even four, right? If Now you're talking. (laughs) Now, yeah. So it is a very much a um, technique that, you know, it's not going to be appropriate for all situations, right? The technique that he uses is to have a single overhead mic, directly over the kit. Mm -hmm. So it's pointing towards to basically picking up the entirety of the kit, right? So that you would get snare from it, you would get the toms, you would get the cymbals. Second mic would then be placed above the floor tom. 
and pointed toward the snare. Some people would get really, really anal with the, the distance with those, claiming that you should have identical distance from the top overhead mic to the one that would be effectively on your side. Using a string or some sort of... Exactly, a measurement measure. device, right? Now, according to himself, he is not that particular about it. Mm -hmm. It's like, it's just like, yeah, it just works. The third mic would be then on the kick, right? And then if you have that fourth one would be luxury, it would go on the snare, right? Mm. By positioning them like that, you would get the entirety of the kit, Sure. You know, in a relatively balanced form, right? What he explains as well, he says, look, you all look at this and then you go, that's never going to work, right? <laughs> but, but, his, but it does, right? And again, it works for certain situations. Now, if you are a modern metal act where everything is going to be hyper-produced and everything, this is probably not your miking method of choice. For drums, but anyway. if yeah, for drums, of course. But let's say that you're an indie act, right? Where, you know, the pure definition of everything isn't as necessary, perhaps. This might be a way to go. And then certainly could be simplicity. If you only have a few mics, something to, to definitely try. So you can it actually... was Led Zeppelin's Levy Brakes drum sound that came from miking a stairwell, right? I believe so, yeah. They didn't mic the drums in and of themselves. They mic the stairwell that he was set up in front of. And that's how they got that giant bombastic drum sound for levy breaks was my understanding. So that's Something abnormal. like that. Yeah. And it's one of those things there again to, you know, try to create something unique, right? Mm -hmm. And having a space that, wow, this sounds good. Like you said, like, you know, we're sort of half joking about the bathroom thing, right? But how it creates a certain environment that sets you apart a little bit. Right. And well, here's another abnormal use too in relation to drums. Yeah. And that is, it's not even an actual mic. It's a speaker. Yeah. You use a little 10 inch speaker or something. I don't know how big, maybe even smaller. And you wire it backwards and set it in front of a kick drum and it becomes a sub for the kick. Yeah. It just automatically makes a low end sound. And the, I learned that one actually from Donnie Grindler. Yeah. He's the one that showed me that as he was recording some drums for me. And I was like, oh, that's cool. Great. I'll make use of that. Sure enough, yeah. I put that in there. And, and, you know, most studios, I would say at this point, they have those purpose built. Well, yeah, know, there's actually, I think there is a company that, that actually builds that oh, as, yeah, a, yeah. as a microphone, even though it's a speaker. Yeah. They pick up just the low end, so you get that really nice, deep thud in your kick. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's one technique that obviously has sort of like taken off. And you could – initially, that would have been like really abnormal. It's like, what are you doing? You're taking a speaker type of thing? But um, No, I'm going to go grill my amp, damn it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, but that only works with guitar amps, right? Sure. And it, it has to be the right barbecue pit. For that, that to happen as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the sub mic thing is a cool thing. I heard something that I thought was really, really interesting. And again, this is probably more of a um, experimentation thing as part, less abnormal, I would say. But the, the well, way but this experimenting is experimenting is going for the abnormal, I think. Right. I heard one of my favorite people, musicians, Charlie Clauser, describe one time when they were. I think this was during the the fragile sessions for mm -hmm. Nine Inch Nails. They had time to experiment. And what they did was they had a few acoustic guitars tuned to open tunings in a room that they had mic'd up, you know, the guitars. As you do. As you do. So wait, and they're miking up the guitars. So are they doing it with some sort of mic on the guitar or pointed at the guitars? How are they doing this? That's my understanding, okay. that they were just like pointing at the guitars. This is not for precision miking type of thing. This is very much for an effect. And what they did is in another room, they had, I think it was actually Charlie who played it. He just played a drum group okay. from a mic'd up kit. The kit then is sent into the PA of the room with the acoustic guitars. Okay really, really, really loud, right? <laughs> so now the sound of the drums is exciting the strings on the acoustic guitar. Sure. 
which is now playing, you know, tuned sort of like open tuning, right? right? And picking up then the signal with different mics. So now they have essentially like a drum kit strumming a guitar. And that's the kind of stuff that you end up with when you got time to burn and a lot of gear and ingenuity to to kind of mess around. But I thought that was like, that is, having the ability to just experiment like that sounds like a lot of fun. Sure. You know, and who who knows if it ever even ended up on the record, but I know they recorded all of that. And if I got any details of that wrong, but, but that was the gist of what they did. That is certainly an abnormal use, I guess, of recording. Sure. But so many cool things that we can do if we think a little bit out of the box, wouldn't you say? That's the idea. Take a mic and do something strange. I do recall one time being in a studio with a group of people, and the studio was attempting to explain how to get a guitar sound, and they were trying to mic somebody up as an example, and nothing they were doing was working. <laughs> So me and my big mouth decided to open it up and say, hey, what if you took this particular mic and you took it from behind the bridge and shot it up the length of the neck? Now, you're talking acoustic guitar yeah, here? Yeah, acoustic or talking, guitar yeah. on this one. Okay. So they took out this microphone and they took it from behind where the guitar, the, the heel or the butt of the guitar and mic'd it from behind where the player was sitting and ran it and pointed it up towards the nut in that direction. Everybody hmm. comes back in and they were like, holy cow, What? how did you know how to do that? I, said, I don't know. just sounded like it was going to work in my head. So <laughs> sure enough, it did. <laughs> so it wasn't, that's not a normal use of miking an acoustic guitar from behind the butt of the guitar and pointed up towards the, the nut of the neck. Sure. And what they were having trouble with in their room for whatever reason with the mics that they were trying to use was that it was getting very tubby and very boxy. And I think it had more to do with the guitar and where they had the person sitting in the room than it had to do with the actual mics in the room itself. So it was just a matter of not moving the person, but just figuring out, let's use this different mic and try pointing it from this direction. And all of a sudden, everything balanced out and it sounded fine. That was not yeah. a normal use of miking an acoustic guitar. And even now, as I'm recording some stuff for a Brazilian funk artist and I'm playing a nylon string guitar. I'm actually miking from the floor, pointing up at the neck to hmm. get the sound, uh, mainly because straight on, it's not sounding right. And I'm not sure quite why, but pointing it up at a 45 degree angle from the ground is working brilliantly. So I'm rolling with it. That's interesting. Yeah. 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 Because that would not be the, the first go-to for me. It's no, like, not at all. It would normally be like, yeah, let's go, you know, 12 inches away from the sound hole or the 12th fret or something like that, right? Mm -hmm. and yeah. Then, yeah, but no, do the white sides way and put it on the floor, 45 <laughs> degree angle. That, that's, that's what you get. Yeah. It's working fine. So, absolutely. No, so the, there's a lot of creativity to be had here. And I guess takeaway, hopefully, from this episode would be to just encourage experimentation. But just to experiment doesn't mean that it's necessarily always going to turn out better. And you do right. you thinking that everything that you're doing is going to be oh this is genius I I hung some cutlery behind my guitar amp and I <laughs> mic'd it from there you know which I think somebody actually did I don't want to mention the artist because I'm not sure that they actually did it but but that's something I heard it was like oh wow okay and it was one of those artists that had done really really well with their first album mm. and then okay now we got a big budget and then the head grew to astronomical proportions and wanted to try everything. So <laughs> there, there comes a limit at some point. And generally when I'm using an abnormal use of a miking situation, it's not always, and actually it's probably 95% of the time, it's not for the main sound. It's for something to add ear candy type vibe to the situation. Yeah. As we start to sort of put a bow on this episode, I, I want to kind of finish off with just, I think it was somebody from Sound on Sound Mm. that had mentioned coming from a reader, they, they were asking, constantly asking questions like, well, how do I mic this instrument? Or how do I mic that? Or being flabbergasted on me, it's like, well, just don't overthink it. How about you just take a mic and point it toward the instrument that you're, you're wanting to record, right? So the Al Schmidt having, <laughs> yeah, right, and get that right first. And it's coming from that, I think, 
can clear up a lot of perhaps confusion because it, it's so much information out there. It's like, oh, you have to do this or you have to do that. Well, just put a microphone in front of it first and see what happens. And then what what's wrong with the sound and kind of go from there. Mm -hmm. Should you get closer? Should you get go further away? Should you angle? Should you get more of a room? It just depends on what it is that you're trying to do, right? But uh, these abnormal users can definitely put some spice into your recordings, I think, if you're going for something just a little bit extra, like you said, with like eye or ear candy, not eye candy, but ear candy. <laughs> I and, hear you. Uh, yeah. With that, let's move on to our Friday finds. Chris, what have you got? I came across a gadget that I thought was pretty handy because I'm sure I'm not the only one that has a bunch of old hard drives lying around. Sure you are. That have been from old systems. <laughs> It's only me. Okay. Well, then never mind. No, but it is a little gadget called Little, or it's actually from a company that I get called Little Triangle. It's called Pro Converter. And what it is, it's a box that attaches directly to old IDE hard drives, mm -hmm. SATA hard drives, that type of thing, and just connects to your system via a USB cable. Mm. So you can access all of these drives if you have any information that you need to get to and not worry about extra adapters or anything or having a computer that actually runs those old hard drive systems, right? Sure. I thought that was a pretty neat little gadget. I would probably be very disappointed if I get one and try to access some of those old drives that I have and probably really overestimate the information that is on there. <laughs> but it's it's a pretty inexpensive gadget. And I thought that was pretty cool. It's kind of like a nice solution without having to go through, you know, all these hoops to kind of get to your old hard drives. So I thought that was neat. Right on. What about Sounds you? Sounds useful. Thanks. I need to get one. For me, I'm looking at the brand new X Delay that just came out from SSL. Ooh. Mm -hmm. Yes. SSL has released a new delay unit. It's called the X Delay. It's not a unit. It's actually a plugin. And it's apparently derived from old 80s units. And I'm trying to rack my brain as to what 80s units they're talking about. But the plugin in and of itself is a four tap delay. You can have up to four taps in the system, so to speak. And they operate independently of each other and they are configurable by adjusting the delay time, which would be standard, the level and the pan of each tap. They can either be synchronized to the project tempo or you can go off the deep end into whatever esoteric time frame you want. <laughs> <laughs> and the other thing that they can do is that you can also really pound the shit out of their feedback beyond 100% volume level going back into it so it can produce some pretty heavy overdriven sound. Plus Wait, so does that mean that you can actually make it sort of distort on itself? Uh-huh. Okay, so you can, all right. Yeah, okay. uh, it's surprising that you're not thinking of like, man, I need to have I, this. <laughs> I, I'm, well, I was going to say, I'm listening, I'm listening. <laughs> so, in addition to the ability to drive itself into overdrive and beyond, there's also uh, freeze and kill buttons so that you can freeze the sound at a certain point and have it continue on, and then you can kill it and, and say, okay, I'm done with that. So Yes, the new right. X delay from SSL. Now, the interesting thing about these guys is they've gone on to the same thing that other plug-in manufacturers have done, and they have their monthly subscription plans. But individually, this plug-in is at around $200. Very there it cool. is, the X delay from SSL. That would be my pick of this week. So while we've got your attention, we ask that you go to insidetherecordingstudio.com and sign up for our mailing list. Doing so will get you a nifty little gift from Chris and I. Plus, you'll get weekly reminders about the Tuesday tips when they come out, and we'll make sure that you don't miss any future episodes of the podcast. If you send us an email at goldstar, G-O-L-D-S-T-A-R, at insidetherecordingstudio.com, Com with the word weird mics. It's more of a phrase, isn't it? It is a phrase. But yeah, you'll get something cool back in your inbox. And if you have a topic of suggestion for Chris and I to explain in a future episode, contact us at the contact page and we'll put it into consideration for a future episode. With that, I'll say see you next week. Thanks for listening, everybody. Happy 100th episode, Jody. <laughs>